This class was started for all the wives whose husbands <laughs> need to learn how to listen. Okay? I'm, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. <laughs> All right, I, I want to get started thinking along these lines. All right, because we're gonna we're gonna figure out very quickly how important this thing is. So let's start with the the first question. And I'm I'm sorry I didn't make enough co uh, copies tonight, but I will do better next week. How would you rate yourself as a listener and explain? You can go one to ten. I'm I'm, I'm an absolutely poor listener at one, or I'm a fabulous listener at 10, you can describe it however you want to. What kind of listener are you? I need help. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, especially coming to this class, Charles. That's a great attitude. All right? I need help. Someone else? Rita? I'm terrible. I'm terrible. Okay. What was the question? <laughs> I have at least three people who found the right class. <laughs> and that's is that is that being helpful? Sometimes. <laughs> Depends on what your wife says, all right? Yeah. Some people have selective hearing even after they get here. So what else? How are you doing as a listener? Kind of think probably that. A little below in the middle. Um, I think probably I have a tendency to be thinking too much about what I want to say good. in response to what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. And that's not good listening. All right. And we're going to come back to that in, in a moment. What can happen if we don't? Let me do it. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared all this PowerPoint, so I don't want to be able to use it. What can happen if you don't practice good listening? Catastrophe. What do you mean catastrophe? Like what? Oh, just my husband. Why? I mean, my husband has been. I think I'm a good listener. I'm just not very patient because he can't hear. He hears certain tones. He really does. He can't hear my tones. And he can hear someone else's. <laughs> and so, they argue all the time. He just can't hear me. And so, I yell. And he says, Kara, don't get mad. I said, I'm not mad. I just want you to hear. <laughs> it's just so it can create conflict yeah. that doesn't necessarily have to happen if you're able to understand one, right? Yeah. What happens if you don't if you don't listen well, Frida? Well, I said I'm a terrible listener. I came from a family who uh, we all talked at the same time. Everybody listens and we separate out what we want to hear. And so, you know, it works. But so then I married the uh, person who's from the family of everybody takes their turn. So I'm busy talking in the middle of everybody, and they're waiting for their turn. <laughs> and it doesn't work very well. <laughs> and, and what does that do to relationships? Well, there's not one. There's not one. That's right. In fact, I, I don't know. I'm not going to speak for Rick's family, but I'm guessing that if that was how you went about things, that the family went away saying, that woman is a blabbermouth, okay, or whatever, you know, right? It can hurt relationships if you don't listen well. What else? I have one. Yeah. Um, I tend to focus on something that's on or that I'm doing like schoolwork or the TV or something. And David will say something or the kids and I, I completely will not hear it. And, you know, they feel less important than Good. whatever I'm doing. So people so oftentimes feel minimized or devalued if you don't listen to them. Yeah, which again hurts Thank relationships. You. Yeah. I don't know how accurate this is, uh, but I understand that the bombing uh, in World War II of Japan could have been avoided if there had been better communication. Uh, there was a there was a, a misunderstanding about words. 
that could have pro uh, prohibited the United States from bombing Japan and, and the, the thousands, tens of thousands of people who were killed because there wasn't good communication. So sometimes if there's not good listening, you end up doing the wrong thing, but you thought you were doing the right thing because you just didn't listen well. Sometimes um, there are misunderstandings that take place uh, between people that, that, that can create all kinds of chaos. It doesn't have to. So what keeps us from being effective listeners? Okay, you've touched on some of them already. What, what keeps us from being effective listeners? What did Tommy say? What, what did Tommy say? <laughs> You're going to say in the midst of while they're trying to uh, tell you something. Very good. Sometimes we spend all our time rather than listening to what the other person says, we're thinking about what we want to say. What else keeps us from listening well? <clears throat> okay. And we can, our mind could be anywhere, right? Our, we could be thinking about job, kids, you know, how my hair looks to this person. You know, I could be thinking about a lot of things, being distracted. Another thing that's been touched on tonight is um, <clears throat> effective communication on the part of the person you're talking. You mentioned about, you know, focusing on one thing and somebody's talking to you. Well, you know, they probably already know that you're focused on something else. Um, one of the things that even after I got hearing aids, if Linda's trying to talk to me from the kitchen and I'm in my office and the radio's on and stuff like that, I may hear her say something, but I did not hear what she said. And that's true even if I'm hearing well because my focus is somewhere else. And so, you know, I'll stop, stop, I'll get up, I'll go in there and say, now what did you say? And good, good, then good. we get to Communication better that way, and I'm guilty of the same thing. She's in her sewing room, and I'm somewhere, and I yell out something, and she says, "What did you say?" <laughs> so, but if we had some elbowing yeah. going on, as you were saying, <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's some people who can identify with that. Yes, our point, our frame of mind, how we see the world, we can hear somebody say something. We may think it means something, but they're coming at it from a different life experience meaning but we don't slow down to really understand their true meaning so sometimes we can just hear something and assume from our point that's what that means and it may not great when, when different people coming from different backgrounds will have will, will understand certain words and phrases in different ways and so that can inhibit listening how about these couple of other things <coughs> lack of effort You ever not just not try not to listen? Okay. You don't try very hard. Okay. Um, no, no skill. Okay, it's a skill to be able to listen. And I think the other thing is, among many, is that we assume we already know what the person's going to say. Ever caught yourself doing that? We may be completely wrong. So there are a lot of reasons. So. Turn in your Bibles to Job to uh, James chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 19 through 22. Somebody read that when you get there. <clears throat> Anybody? <laughs> Therefore, get rid of all Come in, Neil. Come in, Neil. Come in. verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Okay, so what stands out to you from these verses? Just at first glance, what stands out to you? Quick to listen. Others, what stands out to you? Slow to become angry. Slow to become angry. What jumps out? 
slow to speak. I think that last part is key. That it's part of listening is is in doing and putting into practice what you hear. Okay. And it puts put emphasis on it reinforces what you hear when you put it into action. All right. So part of being a good listener is to be able to put into practice the things that you are hearing, the things that you're listening to. Why does James connect being quick to listen and slow to speak with anger? Why does he connect those together? <clears throat> All right, so if there's a misunderstanding, you can get angry pretty quick. If you don't feel listened to, Okay, you feel devalued. Okay, the person's not really listening to me. The person's not really trying to understand me. What's the reaction? Of it? What's your reaction? Of it? You're going to be angry, right? <clears throat> Especially if you, you are a spouse who feel like you're competing with the TV or the newspaper or um, or what? Or Facebook, yeah. If you're, if you as a spouse are feeling like you're having to compete with something that shouldn't be anywhere in the realm of, of value to your spouse, you're probably going to get angry about it. And so, oftentimes, not only lack of listening can incite anger, but when we talk, sometimes it incites anger too. Also, I think that when you're angry, it's harder for you to listen because you want to say something back. And maybe that could be one reason it's included. Very good. You're absolutely right. So I want us, this is, this is going to have relevance for families. It's going to have relevance for our interpersonal relationships. We are tools of God. We are instruments of righteousness in our world. We are the embodiment, as, as the body of Christ, we are the embodiment of Jesus on this earth now. And would you say, especially in our, think back over the last year, an election year and COVID and everything else that went with it. <clears throat> Would you say that our world could use a little better listening? Then who needs to lead the charge? These people need to lead the charge. We need to lead the charge. And, <clears throat> and in helping people in the world, Here's something that, that's, that stands out to me. And, and again, my uh, advanced training is in counseling. So this, this fits what I'm about to say. But I think it'd be true even if I didn't have that. There are lots of people who live in this world right now who feel like no one listens to them. And they're angry. And they don't. They quit talking because people don't listen to them. I mean, they, they go through life and they have the exchange at the grocery store or the bank or whatever. But to really actually reveal some of themselves to others, they don't do it. They quit. Because they haven't found that people really listen. I think we need to be the leaders in learning how to listen. Okay? And so my hope through this class is to help each of us become more effective in our intrapersonal relationship. That means inside of ourselves, you know, understand that more in just a moment. And our interpersonal relationships, our relationships with one another. So I'll understand me better, and I'll almost also understand and listen to others. <clears throat> That's what my goal is for the class. So I want us to understand some things about us as people, first of all. Um, 
we're going to talk about personalities and systems and heart. And I want to, I want to start here that we are uniquely made in God's image. Uh, somebody read for us Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. You can even re read it on the screen if you want to. <clears throat> Then God said, let us make man in our, in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the cre creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All right. What does it mean to be uniquely created in God's image? What are some things, for instance, that separate us from the animal world? They're able to think and rational. All right. Humans have this ability to reason and, and rationalize things. We are able to think in a way that uh, exceeds what animals are able to do. What else? We have a soul. All right. We have a soul and a spirit that indwells this body. And this is kind of a prelude to what I'm going to mention in just a moment. But because we have a soul, we have a sense of what's right and wrong. And we have some pretty strong feelings about what's right and what's wrong. Okay? What else makes us different? What makes us more like God? We're able to love compassionately. Okay. One of the things... Uh, that we have to remember as we go through this life for our own well-being and for the people we encounter is that we were made for love relationships. We were made for love relationships with God and with one another. That's the way he made us. When God said, let us make man in our image. He's talking about the love relationship between father, son, and spirit. And our relationships ideally are meant to mimic that kind of love relationship. What else? <clears throat> We're creative, right? We're creative. We're creative in two respects. Um, some people get are, are wordsmiths, woodsmiths. Uh, they can they can create with, create with art. Don't, don't we see that in God? The beautiful, powerful creativity of God. Uh, we have been given a position of dominion or rule of a creation, and we're free to choose. We're free to choose. So. Somebody read then Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and Pharisees, got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Do you find it interesting that when God gave the supreme commandment, he said, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Do you find that a little bit curious. He didn't say, I want you to love God. He didn't say, I want you to love God with all of you. He, he broke down humanity, our, our humanness, <clears throat> into heart, mind, soul, and strength. Strength being the physical aspect of who we are. But heart, mind, and soul suggest we were created kind of as triune beings too. Just like 
God. And the thing that's significant about that is that some of us are really good at loving with our minds. Right? You know people in your life who are really good at loving with their minds? And then there are people who are really good at loving with their hearts. Okay? And what Jesus is, what, what God said is, and this is, goes back to the Shema, is I want you to love God, the Lord your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I want you to love God with every aspect of who you are. Now, here's the problem. A lot, of us, a lot of us are unaware of the different aspects of our nature, which makes us at times poor communicators, poor listeners. And that's what we're going to look at. Horace, is, is there a little boy in you? Virginia, is there a, is there a part of you like, that likes rules? Yes. Connie, is there a part of you that is a wise woman? Yeah, we don't sometimes we don't feel like it, but the reality is, yeah, you do. You are. Now, let me ask you a little harder question. Carlin, are there times that uh, is 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 there monster characteristics about you at times? Yes, and they've gotten smaller. I hope that they get older. Okay, because if you didn't answer that right, I was going to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I appreciate you answering that. There's a little boy, a little girl, in each of us. There's a part of us that loves rules in each of us. A part of us that's wise. And all of us, all of us have the ability to monsterize the people in our lives. Don't we? Even people we love to. Okay? It's important, I think, for you to understand that about yourself in relationships. So let's break it down even more. Um, I'm going to draw this, what we just talked about, on the board. We've got the little child, which corresponds with the heart. We've got the soul that loves rules. We've got the wise person that corresponds with the mind. And then we've got the monster that connects with the rules. And you'll understand that more in just a moment. So tell me, tell me some things that are true of a little child. <clears throat> All right, a little child's kind of by nature trusting. Keep going. Selfish. Selfish. Forgiving. Can be forgiving. All right. There's an. I'm gonna. I'm gonna put that in innocence. Okay. Impulsive? Brutally honest. Okay. <laughs> they, they haven't learned any better. Okay. They're brutally honest. My son, Jared, was terribly brutally honest. We had many a, uh, an apology that we had to make for Jared those good years. Okay. All right. What is true of the soul, the, the rule keeper part? First of all, loves rules, okay? Order. Loves order. 
Logic. Control. Logic, I didn't hear the other one. Control. Control, good. Rigid. Rigid. Yeah, one for others. <laughs> <laughs> All right, applies to others. Good. What is true of the mind? What's true of the mind? The wise person. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Can distinguish right from wrong. Okay, discerning. Consider it. Keep going. Patient. Patient. Insightful. Insightful. You all come up with great words. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Go with me for a moment and, and think through this. Someone who grows up as an adult and is led by their heart. Okay, here's the description. What's their life going to look like? Peace and balance. All right, so ups and downs. What else? What, why do you, but why? Why the ups and downs? Because it's all emotion. All right. All emotion. What I'm feeling is, is you know, you're always going to see it. Keep going. Well, What's, sometimes it can be that person we grew up with that uh, people would always say, well, this car's in the right place. The pitch just gone backwards. <laughs> okay. Maybe exciting because they, you know, like maybe jump off buildings or something for excitement. I don't know. They're probably really fun to be around. Yeah. Right? Yeah. For a while. Yeah. When, when, when do they all of a sudden not become fun to be around? When there's not something fun to do. Or. They never get serious. Yeah. They don't ever get serious. <laughs> what is. The rule keeper, if they grow up to be an adult and they're led by their soul, what are their what's their adult life look like? High school president. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking from a high school principal, what was their life look like? Perfectionist. Controlling. Perfectionist. Perfectionistic. Frustration. Why frustration? Because they like the rules and the rules are broken. Yeah, both their own breaking of the rules and when other people break the rules. It's frustrating. How about the mind? If the mind is, <clears throat> if this person grows up and the mind is in control, what does this person's life look like? Like the idea of not on action. All right, could be lots of good ideas, but not a lot of action. Maybe slower pace. Maybe slower pace. No fun. Some might consider them to be no fun. Balance. <laughs> you see balance. All right. Here's here's what I want you to understand. <clears throat> Who does Hollywood encourage us to follow? Uh, the monster. <laughs> the heart. Hollywood says, follow your heart. And what, a, what do lives look like oftentimes in Hollywood? Disaster. Temporary. Temporary. Why do you say temporary disaster? Why do we use those words? There's no foundation. There's no morals. No, no foundation. Sometimes there's no morals. It seems kind of fantasy like. You know. Seems almost fantasy like. Okay. Who does God want us to follow? Of those three, who does God want us to follow? Why do you say that? <coughs> Out of those three, it's the one that seems to have the most problems. And 
I think we'd be willing to listen to God and to others. Okay, this is where I want you to understand about how God wants it to work. James chapter 1, verse 5 says, If anyone lacks wisdom, who wants to finish it for me? What? Ask, for it. Ask God who gives it liberally. That's what James 1 and verse 5 says. So here's what's supposed to happen. We're supposed to look to God and our wise person is supposed to fill self with the truth and wisdom of God. Part of the problem is with the heart is the heart is, what, is very much like a little child. And what do little children need? Guidance. They need guidance. Okay? They don't know any better. Okay, they, they're brutally honest. Well, they need to learn better. Okay? They need to learn better. And if we are led by our little child, oftentimes, um, we do a lot of embarrassing things. <laughs> a lot of hurtful things to ourselves. And so what needs to happen, what does Scripture say? And we're going to talk about this more next week. Scripture talks a lot about protecting the heart, training the heart, preparing the heart, okay? But it doesn't talk about being led by the heart, okay? The wise person needs to teach and, and in, in a sense, mature that, that heart of ours, okay? The little child in us needs to be listened to and valued. But the wise person needs to be training the heart. Here's the problem with the soul. Is the rules that we have, maybe good rules, but they may be bad rules. Why might I have bad rules in my life? Why might my soul be guided by bad rules? Family tradition. Family tradition. Not the Pharisee and Sadducee. We're going to come to the Pharisee and Sadducee in a minute, too. Very that's good. That's the way I grew up. That's the way, that's the way it's always been. That's what I know. I'm doing what I know. For instance, you grow up in a family where you learn that the way you handle conflict is to gloss over it, walk away, and then come back together in 15 minutes and act like nothing happened, but nothing was resolved. Is that a healthy way to do things? Satan will devour you. Satan will devour you like that. But some of us grew up like that, right? Our rule, my rule when I have conflict is you walk away and then you act like nothing happened. Other people have very different rules, okay? Some people have rules that if you get into conflict and you think you're losing the, the battle, you start screaming, <laughs> right? That's the way, that's what we learn. Is that a very healthy way to deal with conflict? And that's just one of hundreds of rules. I, I could talk about simple rules like, you know, the ones we laugh about when it comes to marriage. Um, some of you, this may fit. How many of you does it matter uh, what side of the toilet, the toilet tissue roll comes out the bottom or top? Who does it matter? Okay, come on now. Okay. See, some of you, it does matter to Okay? And I'm thinking that's not going to be its its final end. Okay? <laughs> and so however it comes out, it's fine. But there are other people in my family who will go un unmentioned. Okay? <laughs> so that nobody can say that I mentioned any names. Who it does matter to. 
Well, why, why, where'd that come from? It came from my upbringing and my experiences. I developed these rules about how things ought to be. So you have to put it on intentionally. I've learned not to do that. <laughs> so here's what often happens. Somebody violates our rule. And the monster says, you shouldn't have that rule violated. And stirs up the little child in us. And the little child says, that's right. I'm upset. And the monster says, what you need to do is you need to attack. What part of the other person you think that um, we're apt to attack? Which of these three are we apt to attack in the other person? The little child. Oh, the little little child. child. Absolutely. We're going to attack the other person's heart. And they've got a monster in their soul part too. And so what happens is you see uh, bombs kind of thrown back and forth between the monster and the little child, the monster and the little child. And it keeps, what part is left out? The mind. The mind, the wise person. Which means who else is left out? Are you understanding some of the dynamic of why people have conflicts and they never get resolved because the wise person is never involved? I've, I've done premarital counseling here for almost 23 years. And over the years, I've had a number of couples come in um, and they've had some kind of, of conflict that they just haven't been able to work through. They, they love one another. They want to get married. Uh, it's not stopping them, but it's bothering their relationship. I, I've gone through this with them, help them with um, a little communication tool, and they're able to resolve. And the key is this. They learn through the tool how Okay. I don't know how many times I have sat in counseling situations with a couple who is married and then sitting there and thought they believe the same thing they want the same thing why are they arguing <laughs> and you know what the answer is they're not listening to each other. They're missing each other. Okay? So it, this has very practical uh, ramifications for it. Um, we go to another. Uh, uh, and uh, again, adults in the heart will have drama. They'll be moody. They'll have fun for a while. But they're irresponsible. They're hurt and they're hurting. Um, Soul might be considered mean or aloof for conflict. Religiously, what do you think a person, what does faith look like guided by the heart? What does faith look like guided by the heart? Itching ears where you go, where you want, where they say what you want to hear. All right. Sometimes it may be, I'm going where people tell me what I want to hear so that I will Feel. feel good. Okay. How else might uh, someone who is religiously faith wise led by the heart? What might be true of them? Chase fads. They might chase fads. Their foundation is built on sand and not on rock. Their foundation may be built on sand, not on rock. They're oftentimes apt to, 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 to pursue whatever it is that, that makes them feel something, right? So let me just go to this, and I'll, I'll, I'll break it down. Um, somebody who faith-wise is interested in feelings and experience and new things, and biblically it reminds me of Samson. 
Remember when Samson uh, wanted to get married? Get her for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he went to his parents and he said, I found a girl, get her for me. And then he gives his reason. She looks good. He doesn't even know her name. <laughs> she looks good to me. Okay. <clears throat> Rule keepers are more legalistic, uh, condemning, interested in debating. You might equate them biblically with the Pharisees. And then somebody who's led by the mind, faith-wise, is biblical, studious, patient, deliberate, thoughtful. Think about Jesus. Now, here's what I, here's what I want you to understand, faith-wise. Probably everybody in here has an inclination in one of those three ways. Okay? How did Jesus say we're supposed to love God? Oh, Here's the danger. I'm a heart person, and I encounter a person who's a soul person. See potential problems there? <clears throat> what potential problems do you see? Yeah, you have to be really careful that you don't crush somebody's spirit. Because there's also an adventure side to that loving with the heart. Somebody was about to say something. The heart person's all excited about a ministry and got to go for it. But then the soul rule keeper says, well, you have to keep this in mind and this in mind and this in mind. And next thing you know, nothing happens. And they get discouraged and they want to quit. See, when I come to a relationship, and this goes back to what Heather said earlier, when I come to a relationship religiously, and, and I'm going to tell you, I am by nature a heart person, but I grew up in a soul home. Okay? A soul slash head home. <clears throat> If I think that my way of seeing the world faith-wise is the way to see the world faith-wise, what am I going to think about the soul people? Stick in the mud. They're sticks in the mud. <laughs> yeah. Other, other care. How, how else might you describe those people? Unspiritual. They're unspiritual. <clears throat> they don't have the same passion that I do. Me. What? Just mean. They're just mean. Let's go the other direction. How is the person who maybe is inclined toward the soul part going to characterize the person who's led by the heart? Careless? I won't take them seriously. Why not? Because they're superficial and flying. Yeah, those people are superficial. Those people are flighty. Let me ask you again. How did Jesus say we were to love God? Come over to our mind. Our hearts are mind, soul, and spirit. Some of us need to develop our little child in the hand. So we can love God better. Some of us need to develop our wise person a little more so we can love God better. Some of us need to develop our soul part that has a sense of right and wrong better so we can love God better. Okay? So we can love him whole, fully and wholly. But what happens in churches oftentimes, what happens in homes, is somebody will say, well, you're not spiritual because you don't see like I do. The Lord wants all of us. Okay? And so part of being able to listen well is a recognition that who I am may not be all there is. And that God 
me ask you this, and then I'll say, could God love someone who's a soul person just as much as he loves, loves someone who's a, a wise person? Already does. Already does. He died for us all. And so it becomes so important not to get into this labeling, separating, name calling and stuff that, that really alienates people instead of joins them together. It's one thing to talk about disagreements or issues that you want to talk about. It's another thing totally to start labeling people because they're different from you. That doesn't, that doesn't make you a very good listener, correct? It's a violation of the text. It's a violation of the text. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, you shouldn't be any divisions. Okay. Those people are your brothers and sisters. So we need to value them. Again, growing up as a heart person in a head slash soul home um, was difficult. <clears throat> I think I understand both worlds now, but it, it was difficult because my enthusiasm wasn't always appreciated. That's saying it very nicely. Okay. <laughs> yes. Some of us are, I guess you say, ADHD enough that on this day, I'm all clear and I hear a song during worship time and I'm almost in tears. And then the next day, I can't feel. So I'm operating on what I know. I've got to, I've got to hang on to what I know because I can't feel. And I think some of us can be every different one. And that's why he says all of us, because we have a portion of us that's all different things. Not only are we frustrated with other people who don't see the world as well as we do, but we're frustrated with each other. So learning how to love despite differences becomes very important for being a good Because again, if I am of, if I'm coming from the standpoint that my way of viewing the world is the only way to view the world, what kind of listener will I be when I encounter somebody who is very different? Not going to be a good listener. You, you want evidence of that? Just go back and watch the debates. Okay? Not a lot of listening. Not a lot of listening took place. Because people were coming from a different place. So learning how to listen well begins by understanding who I am as a I, as a little child, a wise person, and a rule keeper, and who the other person is as a little child, wise person, and a rule keeper, and that both of us have the potential to monsterize the other, and often do. Okay? What are you hearing tonight? What are you, what are you going to take with you tonight? Because we're about at the close. What's standing out to you? Love God with everything you have. Love God don't, with everything you have. Don't separate parts in your body or mind that you don't give to God. We should learn to be thankful for the people who are different from us. Because it allows us to more fully honor and praise God and accomplish his purposes. There are things that, that people who are different from me can accomplish that I can't accomplish. Because we're different. So learning to appreciate those differences instead of creating barriers because of those differences. What else is standing out to you? The need for balance. The, well, it's easy because you got to left and the right and got in the middle. But it's, you, you need to have a rigid discipline, if you will, 
to be able to allow yourself to enjoy a proper amount of your heart. Yeah. And, and, and since you said that, let me just give a passing note about the heart. What I have experienced over almost 40 years of, of ministry is that most men are almost disconnected completely from their hearts. Man, you can you can you can talk head stuff all day, but we are completely unaware of what's going on in our hearts. I'm not saying we're not affected by our hearts. We're radically affected by our hearts. We're just not in touch with what's going on, there, which is a dangerous place to be. Okay, that you're being led and influenced by your heart, but you don't even know what's happening in your heart. That's what I learned growing up in the home I did. Okay, that even though I'm by nature a heart person, I was effectively told, "Shut your heart." Okay, I don't want that to sound too severe because I, I grew up in a wonderful home in many respects. I'm just telling you what many men experience. We're told from very young ages don't cry, don't show emotion unless it's anger. Okay, and then, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't want much of that. And so we as men are <coughs> hard. We mean hard. <laughs> that affect uh, your listening skills. <clears throat> Talk about it, Mike. Well, you, you'll be, <clears throat> you'll be a, a little people. And you'll, you'll disregard the things that, especially if you're a little people and you're married. So one of those in the heart and crush the spirit. Yeah, that and I went went through counseling for all that. I want to say I want to say this that and this is something I'm still working on, but it's, it's a phrase that I coined a few years ago. You need to become a connoisseur of people to enjoy people because they are different than you, and and listen. Mm -hmm. To me, and I, I just concluded a career in sales. And one of the things I, I found out about listeners, and it ties into self confidence, is a lot of people will say, Oh, he's so self confident, she's so self confident because she speaks and makes wonderful points. But the ability to speak is not self confidence. Being self confident is the ability to listen and not to formulate what you're going to say, but to listen to what the other person is saying and have enough um, knowledge and reserve or have enough faith in God that he's going to give you the answer. But to actually, and you know what, I, I don't know, there's an answer as well. But if you invest yourself in those people, the reward is tremendous. When people, when people want to be heard, Mm -hmm. Society we're in now with Facebook and everything, I mean, that, that's we're coming in and all that. But people don't have the ability to have a conversation or to speak in complete sense. To be listened to. When you sit down with people and you intently listen to them and help them solve or you're empathetic with what's going on, they want to be heard. All right, real quick. I appreciate you saying that because if you will listen to others, guess what interesting thing happens in that dynamic? They become open to listening to you. Which is a prelude to what I'm going to say uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, listen to understand Listen first to understand, then to be understood. Okay? So what I tell premarital couples is you need to become a, an expert at the heart uh, of the heart of your spouse. Expert about the heart of your spouse. So that you can love that little boy and little girl and little man. Because when life is really sweet for a couple, 
It's when that little boy and little girl are, are getting along great. That's when life is really sweet for a husband and wife. So become an expert. What fears, what thrills, what, what hurts that little boy and little girl in your spouse. And protect and love that little boy or little girl in your spouse. And life becomes sweet. Okay? We'll pick this up from this point next week. Go out and be good listeners. God bless you.